we will start by taking some questions from the audience because you waited long enough. And maybe we can start with questions from, for Eva Lissinger. If there are any, since she will be with us for only another 10 minutes. So are there any questions for Eva? Uh, good morning. My name is Lydia and I work for the Spanish newspaper El País. My question is specific for people working more online. And I'm curious about this figure of journalist programmer. I would like to know whether this species exists, if you have some sense of the living outside El País. <laughs> and what's the background of these people? Are they journalists? that become also programmers? Are they programmers who become also journalists or with a special sense of journalism? Thank you. Would like to have a go at this question? I, I, I could start. Yes. Um, well, yes, they are there, but uh, I, I think it's not a must. Um, if, you, if you have a, a bigger project with a visualization, uh, hard data uh, work and, uh, and, and, and design efforts. I think the best way is to, to have the best people doing these sections. But in other things like, like smaller things, I think it's no problem to, to do it on, on the journalistic desk. Well, when I remember when I started to be an online editor in 2000, I couldn't publish my stuff only if I opened an editor and working in HTML. But I would never talk, told me a developing editor. It was just doing stuff to bring things in front. I think on the data journalism, we are on the same stage at the moment. You, sometimes there's the editor open and we are waiting for the tools, but the, the tools are, are growing faster and faster. And I think we will come to the point where the journalist can do a lot of stuff like he's doing his, his text video and text stuff at the moment in content management systems, systems because the tools will, will be there. But um, I think it's, it's great if a journalist has the skills. It's great to, to have a, a journalist who knows what's possible and what's impossible. That's a very big question in the daily, daily doing. If I have a lot of ideas and always go to the devs and say, do it, do it, do it, and they say, no, 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 it's impossible. I, I have to, to, to I, I need to have a, a horizon and, and, and a perspective of, of the possibilities. Does anyone else want to ask a question? Um, so I, I have a, an admission, which is that uh, when I first joined The Guardian, three years ago, uh, coming from a software background, I didn't think of myself as a journalist at all. Um, and in fact, I would say I had a, like a fairly dismissive attitude to the idea of a journalist programmer hybrid, uh, in the sense that I was meeting people who claimed to be that hybrid. And uh, more often than not, they didn't really have a deep understanding of programming. And uh, faced with the kind of things that we were trying to build, um, uh, they, they didn't really have the depth of knowledge required to, to take that kind of uh, challenge on. However, um, having had a chance now to travel around a bit and to see what's kind of going on in other places, uh, I feel that um, my faith is a, a little bit restored. Um, I'd say for, for one example, um, there's a team in the States uh, at ProPublica, and every single person on the team, the, the news nerd team as they call it, um, has basically been given the kind of authorial responsibility where you must do everything. You, as the individual on that team, must basically work as a reporter. You must identify the story, figure out you know, all the sort of traditional things journalistically, but you also have to implement it. You have to you know, familiarize yourself with the appropriate skills to implement. And that's their way of, of, of working, and they produce some great work. So I think that's possible. Um, I also have learned over the course of time a bit more about computer-assisted reporting. Um, you know, if you look at uh, my friend Aaron Pilfer's background, uh, the New York Times, he's very much from a traditional uh, car background, which means that he's got a journalistic training and he knows a bunch of kind of geeky stuff as well. So he can work with databases and spreadsheets and all this sort of thing. And if you want a more contemporary example, uh, there's a, another friend of mine, Ben, uh, ben Welsh at the uh, LA Times, and he does amazing work and it's very much from a journalistic perspective. Um, so what I've started to realize now is that these hybrids can exist. 
But um, what I do wonder is where to start looking uh, outside of the kind of car world for people who've had a chance to learn both things. So um, what I'm seeing increasingly are very enthusiastic people in their, their 20s who've maybe uh, in the process of doing a journalism degree realise that this kind of additional skill set is useful. And in some cases, if they, I have to admit, they have to have, probably have a propensity for programming tasks. But if they've got that propensity and they're willing to develop it, then I'm definitely starting to meet people who can do both things. Um, but I would also concur with Sasha, uh, which is to say that personally I think interdisciplinary teams are a better bet because then you can, you can mix skills and you can get a variety of perspectives on your projects and I think that's a healthy thing. Alistair, could you maybe tell us what computer assisted reporting is? Oh, okay. <laughs> so um, I suppose it's, it's the kind of grand tradition that uh, uh, sort of predates data journalism. Um, basically as soon as um, computer systems got to the point uh, where it was possible to um, sort of uh, easily use them in newsrooms, so we're talking probably around the 70s and 80s, uh, people started to, to look at the possibility of uh, building um, sort of investigative reporting processes uh, based on, on, on using databases. So it's quite frequently used with election data, crime data, this sort of thing. And, um, you know, if you want an example of, of how that can kind of, uh, you know, reach its, its ultimate pinnacle, um, there's a guy called Matt Waite who created a site called Politifact, who's very much got a car background, and that won a Pulitzer Prize, which is probably, you know, uh, you know people right now are saying, oh, well, will, will data journalism ever win a Pulitzer Prize? Well, it's already done that in the sense that, um, you know, this is, this is a few years old now. So, again, he's someone who's both a journalist and a programmer. Thank you. Uh, Bella, would you like to have a thought? Yes, I think the uh, developer journalist is uh, an ideal, actually, and I think it's happening more and more often now because there's young people, as Alistair says, coming out of university who have those skills, and it's happening more in the States um, because they're concentrating quite a lot in a lot of uh, journalism, on journalism courses. Um, but I work in an environment where we don't actually have that right now. What, what we do is we have a, a multi-skilled team and we're trying to learn each other's specialisms to the extent that we can uh, know exactly what we want to do and know whether or not it's possible and have a, an intelligent and informed conversation. Okay? And, and that's probably a really good place to start from. But look to the future, I think it's very much going to be uh, these younger people who are coming out who, have, who don't have the barriers that necessarily we might have when coming from a more orthodox journalism developer, you know, designer kind of background. Um, uh, we have, yes, yeah, so, so but we have a multi-skilled team and you can do a lot of work with a multi-skilled team. I also think it's important to say actually that um, for a lot of projects you do need people with specific skills uh, you do need experienced investigative journalists as well. So, and they have experience in other areas. You know, for example, journalism sources, maybe many years of experience that is particularly useful. And those sorts of people may well not have, are not likely to have these technical skills. So, but if you partner them up with people who do, then you can create great, great things. Yeah, thank you. Eva, would you yeah, well, I, I just want to add and strongly support the idea of multi-skilled uh, uh, teams because sometimes when you're working with a lot of data, you kind of lose the story because you're so dicked in in all the data and you don't see the story anymore. So it's always very good to work in teams and to concentrate on uh, what do I want to show and what is my story. Thank you. Are there any questions from the audience? Just raise your hand and we'll give you a microphone. If you want to ask something. Yeah. Thank you. May I address Bella and Alessia? I mean, I like the, the greeting. Sorry, could you tell us uh, who you are? Okay, my name is Wagner. I've been 40 years research in open government data. Um, I would be pleased. I mean, the way you did making this kind of freaking geeky way of doing journalism into entertainment is not bad, okay? But you're all aware that on the data, raw data level, we have a major challenge, okay? So up to 30% of all public data is either imperfect, uh, it's not valid, it's outdated, or it's even rubbish, okay? So how do you handle that? Did you employ a data specialist? Do you have a multidisciplinary team, even of university professors, which say, okay, this data has to be wrong, okay? Because later on you have to work on the data. This is the most substantial thing. And I didn't hear anything about the raw data level. 
I think it's a really, really good point. Lots of data is just plain wrong. And uh, lots of data that you get, you may have access to, if you uh, FOI for it, um, there's a, an assumption that it will produce, it'll have some truths in it, right? But actually, a lot of data was recorded, possibly, but never with the intention of it never being seen. And so it has so many mistakes in it that actually it becomes very difficult to use. So um, we've had our fingers burnt a couple of times over that with big data projects thinking, oh, this is going to be great, and we've taken the data to uh, experts who, uh, I think that's always a really good thing to do, to go to uh, university professors or statisticians or people who are experts in the field, if it's education data or social policy data or whatever, to get them to uh, have a look at it uh, and give some suggestions about what they think might be the main stories in it. Or if you have some ideas to uh, uh, actually go through it with them and see if they think you're you know, barking up the right tree or the wrong tree, essentially. But that is a really significant point, is that lots of data... This is why it can take so long, actually, to do this sort of thing, because you think that you've achieved something just by getting the data. You haven't, really. That's when your job actually starts, is um, you, ha you need to you know, go through it, and that can take a really long time. So you have people who have... Some, I, I've worked with people who have some computer-assisted reporting background. You can go to centres like the Centre for Investigative Journalism, in, which is associated with uh, City University in London, people who specialise this, in this thing, researchers, and get them on board, really, to help you go through data, depending on what sort of data it is. Uh, yes to all, all of that, I think. I mean... Uh, we're obviously trying to show you projects which we see as successful projects. Uh, the reality is that there are projects that are started but never get anywhere. And that's generally as a consequence of the data not being right. Um, we have the uh, fortune in my team at, at present um, to have a, uh, a lady called Nicola Hughes who's joined us for a year uh, with the Knight Mozilla program. And she has a particular interest in data mining. And so the tasks that I've given her haven't actually borne any fruit yet. She's been going through a succession of incredibly, uh, you know, sprawling government data releases with an attempt to, to sort of, uh, you know, track stuff down. And, and we've sat her alongside people with a more traditional journalistic background who've, you know, kind of given her questions to ask the data. But I think coming back to a specific point, which you maybe alluded to, you know, what do we do to improve this? Um, there is this kind of dream, at least in the mind of, of uh, certain people related to the UK government, Tim Berners-Lee in particular, that introducing semantic data standards is the solution. Because inherently, if something uh, is defined semantically, then it basically it means that all the language is controlled. So if you refer to a, uh, an animal, then that animal will have to come from some catalogue of all possible zoological options and it will relate back to a record somewhere. Now, this idea of uh, semantic stuff, in theory, could bring about um, cleaner data. But uh, I think in practice, that the problem is that government departments tend to see it as an imposition in the first place to uh, prepare data for public release. And at the point where they're also faced with the challenge of, of committifying how that, that sort of language should be used around it, then uh, it's, it's an issue because they, they, they often will, will use that as an excuse to give up. Um, I see probably a greater value to be gained from trying to get people to start releasing, uh, releasing data that is relational data. Because I think one of the problems that we face is, you know, if you get a big spreadsheet which the government have uh, put out, and for example, it's, it's got details of, uh, you know, government spending transactions with specific companies referred to. Um, if there's no rigor in, in the kind of company naming, uh, and there's like 15 different possible ways that a single company could be referred to. Uh, you know, obviously you could theoretically cure that with semantical uh, sort of structures, but I think it would just be better to have a second table, which is a company table, and just have that relationship. Because that's effectively the challenge that we generally have. We have to try and create those, you know, relational models out of uh, data that might be pretty dirty to begin with. So, yeah. Thank you. Perhaps some, some seconds from me. Um, I think working as a journalist is always working with sources and I have to look on the source and trust or trust uh, or have no trust in this source. That's the same. It never changed in, in, in the section of data journalism. Um, I, I think I agree that 
we have to work with people who know the data and ask them, what do you think about this? The same if I get a telephone call and a source tells me whisper, whisper, I tell you something, I have to ask other sources to, to find, might this the truth? And um, perhaps it's, uh, we, we media companies are not in the position to, to, to arrange big data sets from public to, to give to, to the audience, but I think we, in, in some cases, we have to be the tough guy who wants to find the truth and who wants to get the data set. And per, perhaps in some cases we have to go the, 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 uh, the trial way and have, have the pace to, to say we want the truth and we want this data set. Dear government bureaucracy, give us this data set in this semantic way. Perhaps in some cases we have to do this. Thank you. Are there, there's a question there. Hello, uh, Goran Zukovic from the Slovenian Press Agency. Um, uh, yeah, sorry, hope you can hear it. Um, a question about the importance of data journalism to, for your organ organizations. We know that media outlets are facing increasing competition from, uh, from basically, uh, from journalists, everyone can be a journalist now in, in today's age with Twitter and Facebook and everything. Is, is data journalism one of the means of separating the men from the boys with this competition? Mm -hmm. is, that a, is that one of the ways that your organizations see, you know, basically competing against this trend of civic journalism? Who would like to have a go at this question? <laughs> uh, at the moment, we, we have a competition in all departments that colleagues come to me and they want to have storytelling based on data. So I have, in most cases I have to say, sorry, bye bye, see you in three weeks again, no time, no money, nothing. But journalists are storytellers and my colleagues, they, they learned that if we take the time and have the data and have a story behind, it's a great, great way to tell their story, to find the truth. It's from science department going to the, the economy, uh, going to the politics. They all want to, to, to use the best way to tell a story. Sometimes it's just a text, sometimes it's just a video, sometimes it's a combination, and sometimes it's a data visualization. But the, the, the resources are limited. That's the problem at the moment. But there's a separation or something else doing. It's a, it's a fighting on, on the storytelling uh, op uh, opportunity at the moment in our... I think that data journalism is pretty popular at the moment, so you could be pushing a bit of an open door with a boss who maybe doesn't know that much about it. You know, you could... But um, uh, it can take a really, really long time. I don't think people see it as a sort of, uh, you know, a division between... So it's one step up from civic journalism or... or uh, 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 I think, I think it's seen as a, just another storytelling uh, method, just another art piece of, sort of, just another tool in the journalist's you know, box of tools, really. Um, but it is very important uh, to think about how much time that you have for these things. This is why I stressed when I was doing my presentation about the amount of time that these things can take, because it's really important to think upfront about what you want to get out of it, um, to have some idea of who you're aiming at, the scale of it, because you know, you don't have endless resources. We wouldn't have two years in my team to spend on a big data journalism project. You might have it within the whole organization, so you might have journalists and other bits or other elsewhere that you want to hook up with, and you could run, do this thing in the background for quite a long time. So you have to be quite clever about what you're doing. But also, you have to uh, think about, um, be selective about what you want to do. Think realistically about what you can publish and what realistically you can achieve with the resources that you actually have. And I'll try and hook up with loads of people who will do stuff for free. Um, so I must admit that I have, well, maybe from time to time thought of myself as a sort of trophy wife at The Guardian in the sense that I have um, you know, been brought in to use a certain kind of skill set and maybe you know, maybe that is something which is a luxury, you know, being able to recruit someone with this kind of background. But I would sort of say that um, 
even though perhaps the Guardian, New York Times, BBC, they've got kind of quite big teams. They're kind of prohibitively large, perhaps, in, in terms of the you know, overall cost of maintaining that kind of resource. And the other thing is that, you know, as Bella is saying, that the time it takes to produce a piece means that even if you put that team in place, you're not going to be able to just get a piece on demand for every story. Um, so my hope is actually uh, something which uh, I didn't get to cover in my uh, presentation, but basically we've got a, a, a bit of money from the Gates Foundation to create an open source uh, set of libraries. It's a kind of tool set. And uh, what we're ultimately hoping with that is it's not purely about the Guardian. It's going to be something which will be a, a kind of way for all newsrooms to share uh, methodologies. So by sharing components and that sort of thing. The overall uh, complexity of producing a new piece, the, the amount of risk and technical involvement to, to make a new piece can, can be reduced. Because if you've got these building blocks there, then uh, someone with a, a sort of... Uh, less sophisticated web development skill should be able, in theory, to assemble them to, to create pieces on demand. So that, that I see is potentially one, one way that these things will be a little bit more widely invested in, you know, at the point where it's possible for a one or two man team to produce sort of fairly complex pieces, then some of these problems go away. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Um, my name is Bernhard Frank from the ORF. The Austrian Broadcasting Corporation, and I would like to ask, do you know uh, any valuable examples of data journalism embedded into uh, TV broadcasts or news shows, besides uh, doing weather reports or election results or, or scrubbing around a little bit in Google Maps? So that's my question. Oh, like yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, because I come from a broadcaster. Um, uh, we're trying to do more of it, but it mostly it does tend to be election results. We'll be doing some stuff on the US election coming up, and then, um, but that and that tends to be where we put the resources. I do tell you, but what we're trying to do is hook up more and more with the current affairs programmes, maybe where there's more opportunity for this. Um, One well, something we did recently was. Um, create a tool which could be used uh, by a documentary team who's, who are going out to check with people you know, uh, about uh, how much tax they pay, were they surprised. It was with a, with a um, uh, presenter, a journalist called Nick Robinson, and uh, we made this tool on a, to work on a tablet. It went out, they used it in the program, and then it was online. And what we're trying to get to is the point where we can uh, uh, have tools or, or projects kind of embedded in, in um, uh, broadcast, like broadcast pieces, but, but that you can refer to online and, and do it yourself or, or find something a bit more personally relevant there. Um, we've got a long way to go, I think, because the two teams have been quite separate over time, but we've come together much more. I, mean, I mentioned working with Panorama team who'd done big long investigation into public sector pay and who earns more than the PM and they did think to them their credit they really thought let's speak to online and let's speak to Bella's team and see what they can do but they've been working on it for quite a long time before they came to us so it would be good to, what we want what we're aiming to do and I know what they're aiming to do is uh, actually uh, start on projects at the very beginning and work out a kind of cross-platform approach for for the, the sort of data, data, database projects as well as data journalism projects. No. Thank you. Um, I'll talk quickly about three things. Uh, historically speaking, there's a program on Radio 4 in the UK called More or Less. It's just basically uh, a look at kind of like government statistics and this sort of thing with some pretty erudite people uh, giving some sort of fairly, well, generally quite scathing commentary. Um, and I think you know, that kind of format, just having experts analysing stuff, is, is probably a format that you see from time to time. I think um, on a, maybe a more modern note, people are increasingly using motion graphics. And the BBC's got a, a great sort of team working on their broadcast stuff doing motion graphics. And I believe that you guys are working more with them to, to produce work. Because obviously if you, if you create a, you know, a scripted um, you know, sort of... It's quite trendy at the moment to create something with typography and little graphics and that sort of thing. And that's you know, still a pretty traditional process in terms of how you assemble that. You'd script it, you'd have to get in voice talent, probably to do some kind of voiceover, all this sort of thing. 
Um, yeah. Thank you for mentioning something which my company makes. Um, so, yeah, more or less is a program which is we've actually hooked up with much more recently. And we started to create, it's a radio program, and it goes out on World Service as well. And uh, we've started to create little tools with them. So, like, uh, they might do something on what's the world average wage. Have we got any data that can do, that can explain what the world average wage is? And then, you know, we've worked with them, and then we've made a tool where you can go online and put in how much you earn, the country that you come from, and see where you fit in terms of the average of your country and, you know, average of the whole data set, which might be the world. And these are amazingly popular. They're a really interesting way of getting people into it because people love stuff that tells them about themselves, right? They just do. So that's one way which, you, which we're working with them. Yeah, and the, and the motion graphics is a big area as well. Yeah. Thank you, Beth. Yeah, so the, the, the third thing quickly, um, which is kind of maybe looking to the future a bit more. Um, we've got a couple of R&D projects that we've been working on uh, with like the uh, new, I suppose you'd call them IPTV uh, sort of units that, you know, for example, Google and Apple and, uh, you know, and a number of other people are releasing these things which kind of change around the whole dynamic of, of TV watching in the sense that things are generally on demand rather than to a, a sort of programming schedule. Um, and the possibilities that start to emerge haven't really been tapped into yet. I know mean, the BBC certainly has done things from time to time, like, you know, on a Saturday night, if you've got half the nation watching some kind of talent show programme, you can have various interactive things around that, that kind of, you know, you can, obviously you can make graphics out of, uh, you know, what people are thinking right now in terms of, uh, is it person A or person B, all that sort of stuff. Um, and I think actually there is probably, as, as kind of media converges, there is going to be more pressure for, uh, you know, kind of news media organisations of any form to, to learn a bit about that kind of thing, because that could increasingly be the most popular way in which this kind of stuff is delivered. Thank you. Sasha, is German television doing data journalism? Well, I think it's not a question to, to discuss about where, where, where does data journalism starts and where does it end. So if I look uh, on, on, on election um, coverage, there's a lot of data journalism in it. Um, and all the data visualizations we do, it's great footage for all uh, stuff on, on TV. Um, if I remember our story on the tell all, uh, tell all phone, when we uh, showed on, on a map uh, which data is collected by, by the telcos and there was a map and just saw the data from one person um, within six months the life of six months of a person based on real data and uh, we had a lot of uh, TV companies in the house and the, the main footage of the coverage was the visualization after pressing the play button so it's, it's great stuff to show the people the, the, the problem is the interaction the, the most <laughs> A key feature of, of the of the uh, projects is that the people can play with the data. Okay, though you need need IPTV or th something else, but um, the 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 story told on, in this graphic and design way is great to use. Thank you. I think there was one more question over there. Hello, uh, my name is Günter Hack from the Austrian Broadcasting Corporation, yet another imp. Uh, so um, I wanted to uh, talk resources. How big are your teams? How big are your budgets? I know that Zeit Online recently uh, invested uh, some money in, into this field. So perhaps you could tell us what you are allowed to tell. Yeah, to start with Sasha this time. Yeah. Uh, well, I. I there's, uh, in future, there will, will be a real budget, I cannot tell you, but uh, in former times, in the last two years, it was just uh, fighting for, for, for the resources. So there was a question if we can, we can do A or B, so decide. And sometimes B was, was developing the website in some area, I took A and made a data journalism project. Um, but I, I think in the future, all, all the editorial uh, budgets should have, I, I would call it a, a developer budget. 
it's new for, for journalists. They, they, they're used to, to have budgets to have freelancers to write a story or take photos or bring videos in. But I think in the future, there's a, a war on talents who can tell the stories based on their developing skills. And I, I think that's new. You, you need this budget in the future. Then there are different ways you can say, okay, we, we won't have a staff inside. We will work with freelancers. So we did in the last two years. So it was not the time to have new, 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 new staff. Um, or you can say, okay, we want to bring in this knowledge and we will do it in the next year. That's why we will go into this war of talents and we want to get the talents. And I think for us, I hope this is the way, but I, I see for the first a fixed budget and that's great to have to, to, for, the, for the next year. Um, but if, if, you, if, if I, I discuss with, with my colleagues in the departments, they want this storytelling. That's why they say, okay, I've got a budget too. So from the authorship, I will give you some money out of it and then we can do it together. That's the way. They want to, to have this kind of way uh, to, to tell their story. And that's, that's, I think, for the next year, the way for Zeit Online. Alistair? Um, so... I guess we've had a kind of similar journey uh, with my team. Um, we haven't really had uh, a fixed budget. Um, we haven't really had a guarantee of a particular capacity. Um, the Guardian's been doing a lot of restructuring um, around the idea of product management. We don't really fit very happily into the idea of product management because we're kind of content producers. So. Um, whilst uh, quite large amounts of developers are being recruited to work on uh, you know, what, what they call our core products, which are things like the site as a whole and the mobile version of the site and the iPad application, all this sort of stuff. Because we're actually producing content, we don't really fit into um, those kind of budgetary lines. Um, so uh, we've got about seven or eight people now. Um, but of those seven or eight, uh, three of the developers are contractors. So there's sort of the, uh, the fight required to get their contracts renewed. Um, the justification at the moment in two cases is because we've got the Olympics taking place. We've had, you know, supposedly some extra capacity for that. And then in the third case, um, it's someone who's working with us on the MISO project. So she, she's basically working exclusively on the, on the, the kind of MISO project code. Uh, that's the open source thing I mentioned. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think these things are coming into focus a bit more, but the team will never, I think, be bigger than about seven or eight people. Um, and I think, you know, if you look at how expensive developers are in London, I don't know if you know, it's true everywhere, but generally, you know, you're competing with people like banks and stuff who are willing to pay enormous amounts of money. So, um, and then, you know, the startup scene in London means that there's big, you know, even if you're like 23 years old and it's your first job, they'll offer you this huge amount of money. So um, you need to find people who are willing to work for Guardian wages, which isn't always the, <laughs> the greatest uh, sort of benchmark. Um, but it, that's good, because you then find people who are more committed to the cause as a result. So, yeah. So how do you do that? How do you convince programmers to... Well, uh, being the Guardian helps, because you know, you, <laughs> people know who you are, which is good. But that actually, sometimes it doesn't help. What I'm finding when I, I kind of like... Uh, I, I meet people who are in their 20s, um, they've got a much more ambivalent attitude to, to kind of like traditional news brands. So they don't necessarily have the same loyalty. In fact, I, I've got this sort of standard trick, uh, which I've uh, pulled off uh, with great success with sort of visiting, uh, you know, uh, foreigners, you know, people from America in particular, like being taken on a tour of The Guardian. Um, if you do this with someone who's like 22, 23 years old, you can see very quickly they're getting quite bored. And it doesn't really have any significance in their mind that you're showing them the printing press that the first copy was produced on or something like that. Um, so anyway, all I'm saying is there's a, there's a kind of tough market out there and as a result, potentially the, the budgets that you need to put together a team is, you know, is quite considerable. Um, so how many people? Uh, I have a team of uh, about eight journalists and we work with five designers and five developers. But that covers all graphics, every sort of visualisation for the whole of the site. Um, so we work with up to, well, I don't know, huge numbers of journalists from the main newsroom, 20 different online teams. Um, they will come, and every day we will be doing simple, basic graphics, increasing number of which we hope to push back out to journalists using tools. We've, got the, we've had some success with that. 
and also we'll be doing stuff to, to illustrate features, information graphics, explaining how this bomb works, you know, how this nuclear power plant you know works what happened as well as doing working with journalists and working and journalists on my team working on data projects so we don't really have a sort of fixed budget but we have enormous amount of pressure on our resources and we have to decide what projects to do basically on the basis of how joined up they are with other bits of the BBC and how successful they think we think they'll be how much appeal we think they'll get how much traffic we think they'll get balanced of course with an editorial consideration about is this a story that needs to be told um, and uh, in future I mean my team is just about to merge into a bigger team with all of TV graphics creating a new visual journalism department at BBC News so uh, there are real opportunities there for as Alistair talked about putting together you know people who are experts from the uh, TV graphics team doing motion graphics and doing uh, bringing more of that stuff onto the to the web and other platforms as well as us influencing and, and working more closely with people producing TV news thank you Bella there were two more questions at the back Meryl yeah. over there Hello, I'm Ben Atonto from Mainz International. It's a network of news agencies. Um, I have a question. It seems, after all your presentations, that um, data journalism is kind of limited to big uh, news media comp uh, companies um, due to the cost and due to the efforts, to the finances. Um, have you ever thought about cooperating with smaller media or among each other's because once the data is extracted like when you you do so much effort for the extracting it from PDF to a machine readable form would it make sense to cooperate in in some cases with other uh, media and connected to this as, as a colleague from another news agency was speaking right now um, how do you see news agencies role in this terms so is, is data journalism limited to big news organizations would you agree with that And some, sometimes, yes, because we are all learning, and learning means you need time, and you, that means you need money. If you, if you have no existing tool to tell the story, to have a new programmed visualization, okay, it's a question of money. But as you see, we, we want to share the data sets. We, so you can use it as a small company. And um, how we see there, we, we try to... to, to Ah, okay, sorry. Uh, to to work on the tools like the open source project. So we want we want to share. That's that's the way we, we, we do it. And we are sitting here because we want to share our experiences with you, and we want to encourage you to do it because uh, I think it's, uh, the passion for 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 data journalism and and the possibility have this new form to to tell facts and. Uh, well, there are tools already you can use. It uh, might be uh, smaller and not the, the, big, the big visualization, uh, but you, you can already use it. Uh, if, uh, if you look on our uh, basketball, football story, it's uh, quite, all you need is a Google spreadsheet, nothing else. And uh, at the end, your, your content management system to, to bring the, the uh, raw code in. But that's it, there's no programming or something else. You can do it already. Thank you, Sasha. Alistair, would you like to have a go at this question? Um, so I, I think I would come back to this, this kind of open source work that we're doing. Now, uh, I guess what we're focusing on there is more of the process of producing the interactive content rather than maybe the actual process of uh, getting the data together, which as we've kind of discussed in previous questions is something that can be time consuming and, and expensive in its own right. Um, I think there's a kind of interesting second half uh, to, to what you were saying with respect to news agencies because um, it isn't something that traditionally uh, news agencies would think to provide. You know, you provide a wire feed of story content or picture content or something, but certainly having talked to people at Reuters and uh, Bloomberg and people like that in the States, there seems to be maybe a, a kind of desire to step towards being able to provide data sets um, you know, as, as a source. Um, I think uh, 
yes, it's possible that people could collaborate, but there seems to me, I mean, as a programmer, I'd love to collaborate, and I tend to take every opportunity I can get, but maybe there's a kind of journalistic desire to have a scoop, and for that reason, there's, there's maybe a little bit of uh, difficulty in coordinating people. I mean, with WikiLeaks, for example, there was a whole series of, of other news organisations present at The Guardian while we were working on that, um, and we were all kind of like in the same room and we were all kind of happily discussing stuff, but at the end of the day we all went and filed completely different content. Um, you know, it was produced almost in a state of rivalry as much as it was, um, you know, kind of uh, confederacy. So, yeah. Thank you. I think that there is still a culture of that, of that kind of rivalry between different news organisations, but it's changing a bit. Um, and uh, at the BBC, you, um, we're particularly lucky to have different, you know, like radio, TV and online, and I think that it's always very useful to hook up with another outlet. We did that with um, a, the uh, Every Death on Every Road project to get it on to, to other audiences. But I do think that if you are, a, you specialise in one area, just it's an online publication, then it's really worth uh, working with a radio station or a TV station on the same project because you will get more bang for your buck that way, you will get more exposure and it's a good way of, of, uh, of sharing things. But also, I also want to say about data to journalism projects, they don't, I think there's a whole range, there's a massive range of them, right? So you can do things which are really uh, quite small. You need to think what sort of data journalism you're trying to do. Um, one of the, uh, the journalists at the BBC, it's like this week, uh, she came along with some sp a spreadsheet that she had gathered herself uh, on her downtime that she had um, worked with. Basically, basically, she'd FOI'd every police station, police authority in England to get data on uh, domestic violence on football uh, on days when there had been football matches during the World Cup in 2010. Because there's sort of a link between domestic violence and football, right? And... Um, and she got the data from all these different uh, police authorities and she compared it to a previous year uh, and, and days when there were no football matches. And, uh, and then she took and taken all the data to a statistician who had gone through it with her and worked out that actually there, was, there seemed to be on uh, wins and loses, there was like a 28% rise in domestic violence. On draws, there was... A just fine. So it seemed to be certain things motivated people. And what happened from, as a result of that was that uh, as part of that, all the, all the police authority, authorities released, you know, did a bit of a press around trying to you know, uh, be aware of domestic violence and stop domestic violence, because they were very keen on the story as well. And it, that didn't require a great deal of resource. I mean, she did it off her own bat, um, and it took probably her working a couple of months herself the web production was minimal, really. It was a story, and then we published the data, and we did one simple visualization on it, which took us like a, you know a day, a designer a day. And that wasn't you didn't have to do that. You could have used off-the-shelf tools to do something like that. So it it really depends on scale. I think there are lots of opportunities out there for people who spot you know who spot stories that they want to tell. Thank you, Bella. Um, there were there was one question over there from Nicolas, I think, and then we'll take the rest. Yeah, I had a question for Sasha. Uh, you said that um, you did this uh, nuclear power plant thing in just two days with uh, Gregor Eich. Yeah. Uh, my question is, how do you do it? Because in my experience, journalists have a very hard time defining the specifications for an app. And so it takes a lot of back and forth between the developer and the journalist. So do you have like a project manager at site who does that? Um, well, from my position in the, uh, as an editor in the R&D department, it's very often it's, uh, it's, it's a job of a project manager to bring all the people together, the different skills, and uh, very often my, my skill uh, bring in is my journalistic view, but in most cases uh, I have to, 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 project, to, uh, to do project management. And on the other hand, uh, if you talk uh, about Gregor Eich, uh, he's uh, a, a top guy. He's uh, uh, he's uh, he's so great and organized that you don't have to be a, a project manager. You, he's he's your manager in this moment, <laughs> and uh, so that's the way. Yeah. Thank you, Sasha. I saw there are two more questions over there. One at the back, and then I'll take a question from you. Uh, did you ever do a project where your application was connected to real-time live data? 
That would be interesting. Who would like to have a go at the question? Alistair. Um, so, we, I think they're the kind of, uh, the quote that I heard um, at NICAR this year, which is a kind of conference for, uh, well, car reporting, but also now data journalism, is that elections are like the gateway drug of data journalism, in the sense that uh, if you were to come into a paper to take this kind of role, you will almost certainly have to cover an election at some point. And increasingly, elections are being seen as the the, the sort of uh, the place where people want real-time data, perhaps you know more than any other occasion. But I think also with sporting data, that's uh, you know increasingly attractive as well. So I don't know. The BBC probably have uh, some pretty impressive stuff uh, coming out for the Olympics, uh, New York Times as well. Um, you know we're doing stuff um, based around the idea of live. I think the idea of live is something that TV and radio do very naturally and well because they've had a long time to think about it, kind of get. Uh, good practices in place and I think that news organisations are struggling a bit at the moment to kind of catch up with that. I think that's one of the things the BBC is you know, kind of really going to make a, uh, a lot of headway with, with this integration that I mentioned because you know, being able to combine the two, um, I think what, what journalists can do maybe uh, quite well is the, um, the provision of, of kind of context and, and sort of summaries around things and sometimes it's nice to kind of cut between you know, the actual live action of a, a thing and then some more kind of considered summaries. So I see some kind of convergence at the moment of like live blogging, which is kind of like increasingly popular, um, with basically, you know, sort of the charting of real-time data in various different formats. Um, but I can't say anything more because it's all secret, sadly. So there you are. Yeah, thank you, Alistair. Bella, would you like to add anything? Yes, I'll add a couple of things. Um, so uh, I don't work in sport, but... The Olympics, that there's massive plans around the Olympics, and it's all about live, and uh, it'll be from watching video streams, so lots and lots of data that you'll be able to find out about all the individual athletes, and lo all the stuff will be coming in live. So uh, watch the BBC site during the Olympics, it's the official broadcaster, so that's my plug on there. Um, uh, and, and elections are the main thing, I think, that, that's where it comes up time and time again. So my team does work on elections, and we've worked on... Uh, you know, the UK general election, uh, all the, the local uh, U the elections around the UK which happened in May, which are really big for the, for the BBC as a public service broadcaster. And there's lots of issues around getting the data out live. And if it's not and the systems fall down, then typing in as quickly as possible from some source. Um, mostly it works really well. And we'll also be doing um, the US election, uh, elections and working, getting the data from AP. And we sort of funnel it in and push it out again. Um, so uh, live is really uh, where it's at. And we're, so we're working more and more with our live blogging team, our live page, uh, on, around news events. And we'll be, we'll be trying to do more of that in future. Thank you. Sasha, is site online do, doing data projects? Not that big. We, we did some stories about in sports where we've been connected to, to the results and the standings, but it's not uh, the big live thing. Just another point of view, I, I think the clue of the uh, World Cup bubbles is that life is freezed and we can see the emotions of, of people see it again. So if it just was, would, be, would have been a live coverage, it was gone and yeah. nothing. Would, the clue sometimes is to, in, in the huge amount of conversations in the social media sphere, to, free, to freeze this view on this emotions and, and give us the chance to see the emotions during um, a World Cup match, for example. Well, I, I'll say one, one last thing then, which is that if you actually think about what real-time data journalism actually means, it's a little bit of a tricky one, because journalism generally requires editorial decisions, but if something's a live feed, then you're not necessarily editing it. Okay, you can cut between different live feeds. You know, there's a kind of editorial judgment there. But I think if you look at the more technical aspect of it, there's really no such thing as working with purely live data. Generally, what you're doing is you're building an infrastructure that has to support lots of people connecting at once. Um, and in order to do that, what you generally do is you, you kind of incrementally record something and you make the last chunk available, you know, with some caching involved. So what that also means is that you can start to do some kind of calculations because the data journalism, you know, obviously it's going to require some kind of analysis, right? So you need to be able to either do that all on the client, which, you know, sometimes is impractical, um, or, or you basically need to have this sort of system, which if you imagine it being a bit like a pipeline, 
you're, you're introducing a little bit of latency, like a minute is tolerable, right? And in that minute, you can do quite a lot to the data. But there's a kind of a little bit of a, there's a limit on how far you can go. So for example, with the thing I'm going to talk about tomorrow, um, at the end of my workshop, which is our Riot Rumors piece, where we were kind of uh, visualizing Twitter uh, traffic uh, around the London riots, and we were showing how rumors sort of spread and fall. Um, people often were asking me afterwards, could we apply this to real-time context? But the reality is that we were doing some pretty big number crunching on very large amounts of tweets, using some sort of uh, friends from the academic world. And when we sat down and looked at how feasible it was to put that into real time, because imagine you have to compare every tweet in a, a body of two and a half million tweets with every other tweet in order to make certain kinds of statistical analysis. It's very hard to do that. Uh, you know, it's possible, but it's just hard. So it's just another kind of frontier that we have to explore. Thank you. We are almost running out of time, but we have time yeah, for the last three questions. Yeah, maybe at the back. Uh, Gregor Eibel from the Federal Chancellery of Austria, um, responsible for the national uh, data, open government data portal. Um, as a lot of open government data portals are popping up everywhere, uh, in UK, in Berlin, uh, also a lot of in Austria, I would uh, ask, uh, uh, how, how much of those uh, uh, open government data portals you're using in your daily practice as a source for your investigations? Because mostly in your graphics I've seen that you consulted statistic offices, uh, but not those open government data portals. So my questions are, how often do you use it and what are your experience with uh, all those open government data portals where uh, a lot of data is published voluntary basis uh, of government data. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Who would like to have a go? <laughs> <laughs> so, shall we start with Sasha? <laughs> um, uh, in Germany it's, uh, it's quite difficult because there are not that many data sets to use. Um, well, you we saw the um, population story was based on the Federal Bureau of Statistics, but that's not government data. That's official data, but it's uh, not, not what we are expecting. When there is data provided in Germany, very often it's uh, not meant to be used as data. For example, it comes as a PDF to you and you're sitting in front of the PDF and saying, okay, you wanted to say it's public, but you don't be very serious with what you're doing. So, so some steps we, we have to come to, to, to that the government people see that's a real chance to, to provide the data. And that's not a secret they have to keep. But that's a point we, we have to and I think Friedrich will talk about it. Hello, Friedrich. And... Um, the long way. That's why there are not many stories we, we, we could told in the, in, the, in the last time. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I'll just recap a couple of things that I think we touched on already. One was that um, we did the, uh, the project that I showed with the public spending data, and I think um, we did have to do quite a lot of work there to get it to a stage where we could um, actually produce what we wanted. Um, and then, as I also mentioned, I've got this member on my team who has been kind of focused almost exclusively on working uh, with some public data sets um, and we're kind of finding it hard, you know, it's, it's hard to get them to a state where they are um, easy to use. Uh, but then I'll second uh, Sasha's point which is that the Open Knowledge Foundation uh, are doing great work in that, that area. So um, in some ways uh, maybe public sort of spirited ventures are a better way for dealing with public data than newspapers because newspapers tend to have this focus on finding exclusive stories, which isn't always the sort of best coupling. Thank you. Bella, is the BBC using publicly available data sets for reports? Yes, it is, but not always from a particular portal. I mean, lots of data is available, um, and I think what's more important is now that there is an increasing culture of making data available, very much so, I think, and that is a big change in the past few years. And that if the data isn't there, then what you can do is go and FOI for it. And you've probably got a good chance, as long as it's not going to take too long, um, of getting it 
Um, and data, you know, so we use all sorts of government departments. Um, we use Office of National Statistics, uh, as well as lots of big international data sets from the UN, WHO, OECD, all that sort of thing. So it, it's quite a wide range of, as well as local authorities and um, uh, police authorities, cons constituency data held by uh, various different authorities as well. We had a question here on the front row, and then we'll take the question from the okay. second row. Uh, just a brief related question to our British uh, fellows. Um, before the Guardians kicked off the nine, in 2004 with, uh, with the data campaigner, I'm sure that you and even the BBC were assigned financial funds to license commercial data, both from the public sector and from the private sector, okay? How did this budget continue and develop over the time? And was it decreased or increased? Or did the publishers tell you, okay, please substitute commercial data by open data? And secondly, especially in the UK, you have a bunch of reuse companies which specialize in the last 10 years to refine data, re-aggregate data, and put it together. So really provide you this on the raw data level so that you, as a publisher, don't have to go under, under this level. Do you license those data? Do you have funds for that? Um. No, not really. Well, so uh, what we do is um, traditionally, uh, let's take school league tables, for example. We um, produced a, uh, we used to do loads and loads of work on that, put lots of public resource into producing this content uh, for people to look at. And increasingly, and we produce a page for every school, and that was something which we spent a lot of time on. But increasingly now, the Department for Education has done a really good job of that, so we have pulled back from that a bit because we can save resource in that area. In that, um, and what we do is we offer, we've reduced our offering because other people are offering more data uh, freely. Um, I guess ours is a sort of public service interest. Um, one of the things that we did when we used the um, uh, road crash data, the data on road casualties, uh, that wasn't initially available to us because of what we wanted to do with it, which I've said before. And then, actually, what we then did was, when we got it and published it, that then made it easier to release that data. And it was released to other organisations who have used, tried to make you know, a commercial funds that tried to make money out of using that data. But because we got in there first and used it as a sort of public service, a public service way, we continue to offer that. So there's not really any competition in that sense. There might be if we wanted to, BBC wanted to go in and, and get into a field where um, people were trying to make money out of selling data, that would be an issue for you us. We do publish, we do, for the business team, it does buy in lots of business feeds and stuff for market data. Um, so, as I sort of mentioned at the very start of my talk, I've only been with The Guardian for three years, so I can't speak to the kind of history that you're describing because I don't really know about it. Um, what I've seen in the time that I've, I've been working on stuff at The Guardian is that there is um, sort of, I guess, uh, an obvious kind of commercial relationship that exists with agencies, generally for sporting data, business data, this sort of stuff, because, you know, it's something where... Uh, you go back to the point where it was just a print publication, there was a, a kind of like a, you know, the PA would charge for football results or something like that. It's just a, a kind of commercial relationship that's existed for a long time. I think specifically with the projects that we work on, um, one of the important aspects of the project work uh, is a fairly classic journalistic thing, which is that you have to negotiate your sources, right? You have to spend some time on the phone to negotiate. But when I talk about negotiation, I'm not talking about money. I think there's virtually never any money involved. Um, the one thing which is probably costly to us is potentially sometimes there's a legal cost. You know, potentially we have to get the Guardian's legal team to kind of like figure out an arrangement with a third party. Um, so even though there's no uh, you know, kind of monetary cost involved with paying them for the data, there's a cost to us in terms of getting the legal team to, to get the right agreement in place. Uh, thank you. If you're not too hungry yet, we'll take one last question and then give the panelists an opportunity to give some short final remarks. Um, okay. Um, I think that uh, the, the, uh, this kind of journalism uh, is a, a very powerful tool, but uh, 
in my opinion, there is also a problem, and a big one. Uh, could this uh, uh, approach uh, build a, not a digital but cognitive divide into the readers? What I want to mean, uh, what's your feeling? How many people in European countries, for example, are really able to read uh, at a graph and to manage it? Um, What's your feeling? Do we need a new relationship between the education course that presently is not oriented in managed data, more or less in all the European countries? Yeah, thank you for that important question. So do we need to build data literacy among our audiences? Who would like to answer? Uh, yeah, I think that... Um, Publishing, there's a, there's, a, there's a kind of ambition and idealism around this, isn't it? That if we publish lots of data, if, if lots of data is put out there, that anybody will be able to go and look at it and interpret it and be able to hold the government or governments to account. Well, that is quite a dangerous thing because most people, 99% of people, probably won't go and look at it, wouldn't know how to interpret it when they get there. And so, you know, there, there, there is something around this. And what you'll get is interest groups, and, and uh, you know, it will be used by specific groups of people, and, and uh, that would be a good thing. But I think that the expectation that lots of people will be able to look at it is, um, is, is not realistic, or will choose to look at it. Um, I, I think this the important role for news organisations is to interpret it and put a layer over it often and to allow people to uh, access it, but also to tell stories about some of the most important things in the data and to think of ways to express the information that will not drive people away from it. That's a kind of really kind of a central, central plank of you know, any sort of visualization, really. And as I said, that we have done focus groups with people who are very intelligent and very news-focused and sort of everyday people who don't think about this stuff all the time. They're the normal people, not like us. And they, um, they uh, will will turn off from graphs and pie charts and, 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 and stories that have loads and loads of figures in them. It is a bit of a problem in that respect, but we have to work harder to um, enable people to, uh, to attract people and enable people to and pull them in and make sure that they, they, they understand it. But you, know, you could say it's a bigger ask really, isn't it? But to go back and say, <clears throat> maybe we need to look at you know, our uh, education system. Maybe we need to make people more numerate. Maybe we need to make sure that everybody knows about statistics or knows how to read stuff, and read spreadsheets, or knows how to do this. But they don't right now. And so st starting at this point of realism, it's up to us as journalists to go out there and explain it in a kind of simple way. Um, so funnily enough, I was having a conversation uh, with uh, Daniela last night uh, about a book that we both like, Fast and Slow Thinking by Kahneman, which is kind of specifically concerned with certain cognitive uh, biases that are kind of inescapable and it, they result in uh, you know, the human grasp of statistics is always rather forced it's not something that comes naturally so in the context of how you, you sort of structure pieces to adjust potentially to those cognitive biases sure that, that there needs to be more literacy there needs to be um, you know, it's not something that newspapers can demand we can't necessarily lobby the education system to you know, get them to show people data viz pieces from the age of 11 to help them understand them. Um, but you know, I think that, that literacy is potentially emerging naturally as a, kind of, a certain kind of visual language is used more. Because you know, if people are seeing a visual language used more and more frequently, then the chances are they'll want to make the effort to understand it. And maybe I'm wrong in thinking that. Um, but what I also imagine is that we are, as a result of our kind of response to uh, measures of reader engagement, uh, and Bella's talked a lot about that, I think, today, uh, we're probably starting to favour certain kinds of formats over others because we, we kind of see from the, the kind of hard numbers that people are, are more engaged in certain contexts than they are in others. And if you look at something like the, the World Cup piece, um, it had some balls flying around. There was a sense of liveliness and, you know, sure, that's all, all based on some kind of like number crunching and some quite complex physics behind the scenes, but what it produces is something which is it's kind of almost like a, an animated game visual. Um, and then, you know, if you start talking about games, there's a whole other world you can start talking about in terms of how you can apply 
uh, you know, game mechanics to interactive pieces to try and make them more engaging. So yeah, there's a, there's a lot of stuff that we can do and we will probably learn about with time experimentation. Thank you. Sasha, would you like to add I, I totally agree. Just one point, I, I think it's very different to, to if you follow the discussion within the data journalism community. Um, the, the main job for a journalist, in my opinion, is telling the truth and telling the truth by separating the important from the unimportant. So that's my, my, my I think a journalist and a data journalist has to do the same thing. He has to tell the truth based on the data he uses. He has to, to ask if this the, the data, uh, can I trust the source? And on the other hand, I think I have to give some, some help to, to the readers to understand the data. Uh, I think it's, not a, it's no solution to give all our readers with a pure Google spreadsheet that dive in and find your story, bye bye. That's, that's not, not our journal, journalistic job because we have to find the best way to, to understand and find the story. Uh, for example, if I have a diagram, I heard from colleagues, you're not allowed to start with a zoomed-in diagram because the reader has to see the whole re uh, diagram. I, d I disagree because I want to, to point on this story in this diagram. Well, I, I think it's important that there's the, the, uh, th that the reader can zoom out and, and work with it. That's very important. But I think we have to point on the story and they, we think this is the important part in the story based on this data. And I think we have a lot to learn in the information architecture. And I'm still a learner and I'm not sure what kind of visualizations we will have in some years. But I think we have a lot of learnings on the reader side and on the author side. And that's us. Thank you. Um, we've almost reached the end of this session. Uh, before we end, I would like to ask the panel for some final remarks. Um, on uh, what is your opinion on what the future of data journalism will be? Who would like to start? <laughs> okay. um, I would like to say that I think the future looks uh, quite rosy for data journalism, but I think you have to be realistic about what we're doing. And as we go along, I'm pragmatic about it. And as we go along, we'll learn more and more about what our users and our readers will, what their tolerance will be, what they'll want to engage in, and we'll provide better ways of enabling the diggers, the people who really want the stuff to get into the content. And so maybe we'll have a two-tier approach. We're providing simple overviews for things, and then we'll be providing uh, more and more uh, 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 in-depth content as well. And um, yeah, I think it looks good. And I'll also say that, uh, uh, you know, it don't be overfaced by this because actually there are lots of stories out there which are very easy, well, not easy to do, but they're simple to do in the sense that as journalists, you don't need vast array of resources to go and get them. You just have to think carefully about what you're going to do. You just have to plan it out and don't let, I guess it's something trite at the end to say is don't let the best be the enemy of the good. Don't try and do everything. Try and do something which is good and which you will be able to get out there and publish for your readers. Yeah. Thank you, Bella. Alastair, would you like to give some final short remarks on what the future will look like? Um, so I, I think we are in the middle of a period, uh, a golden period perhaps at the moment, insofar as uh, there's a lot of experimentation. And uh, prior to working for The Guardian, I spent a lot of time in startups. So I kind of got a sense that in, in uh, quite a large number of, of kind of domains of human activity, you, you will have a period, a kind of almost like an evolutionary period at the beginning where a lot of ideas are tried out. Um, but in line with some of the things we've said already, I think that you know, we, we, we're kind of trying a lot of things out, but we're starting to find kind of uh, certain underlying truths. And as a result, there will be kind of more and more um, uh, I guess kind of common formats, standard formats reached uh, where, where, we, where you know something becomes uh, you know as universal as the you know way that you might structure a 200 word article. Um, there's kind of I think a, a room for that and I think uh, what then follows is uh, as these projects like our uh, Gates funded project 
start to appear more and more. I know that, for example, the uh, Knight Mozilla Partnership has got a, a website coming out. Um, if you want to look it up, they're, they're kind of running a scheme called Open News. And there's a website which is called Source, which is going to contain a load of tutorials and source code. And it's basically, I think, um, you know, given the, the moment in time that we're in right now, it's going to become increasingly prevalent to see uh, people sharing their work, people explaining how work was um, uh, constructed and then sharing that methodology so that other people can uh, uh, not make the same mistakes twice and not reinvent the wheel. Thank you. Sasha, a few final words on how the future of the field yes, is uh, like. Yes, we, we are advocates for, for data journalism and we, we, we think that we have a new form of storytelling. We have in our row of, of storytelling methods we can use and I agree we will we will find formats to tell these data stories and we will have tools and I just want, want, want to encourage you, just try it. Just use the tutorials and uh, just try it. But if you are in editorial stuff, don't play the trumpet and say, T -t 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 I will do data journalism. Just do it in a small story. Try it out and you will see you will, you will have your success and you will, will have your stories. And just going to the talents. We need these talents to, to, to program this stuff. And um, the question how to, to bring these this talents to, to your team. I think it's quite important that we journalists say, must say we are all on the stage. We are all on the stage and bring your deaf colleagues on the stage and, and give them the, 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 uh, the possibility to shine with you. Because we, we journalists always are the people in front of... of the newspaper and say, hey, we did it, it's our story. But in the future, it's quite important. That this is the guy who enabled me to tell this story. And just take him the chance to stay next to you on stage. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. Uh, we've reached the end of this session. Um, you've been an amazing, very active audience, so I'd like to thank you for that. And I'd like to ask you to join me in giving a warm thank you to our panelists for...